Once again, I will introduce Greg. Since most, of you, since most of you were here last night, I really don't have to say anything else about it, but I know he's going to introduce uh, Julie. Um, actually, first... So, Julie Eilers, her maiden name is Leck Band. German folks, they were known as a band of Lex, and they became Leck Band. Julie's going to tell you a bit about our story. I'm going to fill in a teeny weeny bit, not to step on her toes, um, but she was living in Iowa and I was living in Michigan. We were 900 miles apart. We never dated. When I went to Iowa to move her to Michigan was the 3rd of December. The congregation had met Julie. She had visited Port Hope twice. They knew that we were crazy about each other. But now we moved her in the first Advent Wednesday service. After the service, oh, there were 60 people in church, I suppose. Julie got up with me after the service, and I announced Julie has now moved here, and Julie and I are engaged to be married. Clap, clap, clap. And we're going to be married on December 30th. <laughs> and thankfully, more clap, clap, clap. So we got married very quickly without really ever dating. Before we got married, Julie said the most romantic thing to me. <laughs> she said, honey, you're the second best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, she'd been married before, so I'm like, it better not be that other guy. <laughs> but then she showed herself to be her own fine theologian she said, the best thing that ever happened to me was the day I was baptized into Christ. That's right. I have a piece on my blog titled, uh, The Best Day of My Life, I think it's titled, in which I steal her theme that May 19th, 1957, when I was 19 days old, was the best day of my life. I said last night, Julie's the smartest people, smartest person I know. Early on, when we were falling for each other, I came to call her my heart. And I'm forgetting the last gag I had lined up <laughs> to introduce you. So I might have to leave it at that. Your mic is set. You're ready to go. Ryan will tell me it's not. Ryan, pay attention to the level, Julie tends to speak softly, but folks, she carries a big stick. My heart, my wife, Julie. I guess I better do, I'm soft-spoken, so I appreciate that you are sitting toward the front. Uh -huh. um, prodigal son is back for parties. <laughs> um, Hi, good morning, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Us. I am a cisgender person. By definition, that means my gender identity, my internal sense of being female, corresponds with the sex by which I was recognized at birth. Congratulations, folks. You have a daughter. Let me tell you what it means experientially. It means that upon rising in the morning, I think about what I'm going to have for breakfast, what I'm going to wear, whether I'm going to the gym in the morning or on the way home from work. When I'm in the office, I think about my work, meetings, interacting with my coworkers. On my way home, while filling my tank at the gas station, I think about what I need to pick up at the grocery store. And when I'm at the grocery store, I think about making dinner and exchanging pleasantries with the employees who helped me find the lemon juice and rang up my purchases. Not once does it come into my mind that my brain does not match my body. Not once do I think about how the name people use for me, Julie, doesn't fit who I am. Not once when I say hello to the male at work or at the store, do I wish I were in his shoes, free to be male, inside and out? Not once do I think about how people view me 
as a female person. I go about my merry way, cheerfully oblivious that my female gender fits me. This is a luxury trans people do not have. Every minute of every day, they are aware their mind and body do not match. Every minute of every day, they are faced with the reality that how people view them and interact with them is at odds with their brain experience. Did you know that the brain transmits and receives millions of neural signals every second? For the most part, those signals do the job they're supposed to do, crisscrossing the central nervous system, communicating with the rest of the body. The transgender brain sends and receives the same signals, but some of them are returned undeliverable. I'm a computer geek, so I use an analogy that makes sense to me. The computer central processing unit, it's the CPU, is the brain, and it sends signals across the motherboard, the central nervous system, communicating with the RAM, the hard drive, the graphics card, and other hardware. That's the, those are the body parts. If the components are compatible, it all works great. We've got a lean, mean computing machine. In a trans person, some of those components are not compatible. The brain might be male, but the body is female. Because the hardware doesn't match, the CPU is constantly resending the signals. On top of that, the software, that's how people view and respond to you, is on a Windows system, but it was designed for a Mac. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the users, your family, your friends, coworkers, the public, they're insisting the system be used for gaming, cool. husband, father, brother, son, when it was designed for word processing. I realized I was a bit stereotypical there. I know plenty of women who love video games and plenty of men who are active communicators. But please understand my point. For those of us who are cisgender, our internal sense of gender matches our external being. We never experience that disconnect between mind and body. We never experience the disconnect between how we feel and how we are perceived. Before Greg and I got married in 2001, he revealed to me that he was a cross-dresser. While I didn't know much about that, I recognized that it was, one, an inherent part of him, two, that it was something he struggled greatly with, and three, it was something he wished greatly he didn't have to struggle with. It wasn't a deal breaker. My attitude was that all humans deal with hard stuff. Some struggles are private, some are public, but as long as you're not harming anyone, you shouldn't suffer shame for being human. I wasn't going to let this hard thing separate me from the person I adored. Life was ever so blissful. This soulmate of mine was goofy and full of fun, but he also took the important stuff seriously. I received from Greg Eilers respect, unconditional love, kindness, graciousness. All of that continues to this day because all of those qualities are inherent to who he is. A decade or so in, frustration began creeping into my good-natured husband. There was much I could chalk that up to. Perhaps it was the, the usual demands of the ministry, parishioners being lax about attending worship, the extra burden of Greg twice serving a nearby vacancy, or maybe it was the many times Greg got called back early from vacation due to a death in the congregation. Perhaps it was the unusual demands 
of the ministry in Port Hope. Just read the chapter titled Tragedy Town in Greg's autobiography, Roller Coaster Through a Hurricane, to read about the unique and outsized challenges that hit that small town and congregation. Or maybe it was Greg's frustration from watching the kids grow up, graduate, and move away, living far too, far too away for us to see regularly. But under the surface of Greg, much more was festering. The internal struggle he'd experienced since childhood, his desire to be female, was growing. And by early 2013, had become a raging battle. Before I left for work, the morning of March 8, 2013, Greg confessed three things. That he was spending most evenings dressed up as Gina. That he fell into deep despair when it came time to be Greg again. And that the only escape he could see from that despair was to be a woman or kill himself. I was a tax preparer, and tax season found me spending 12 to 16 hours daily in the office, so I had not been privy to the torment my spouse was experiencing. But with that revelation, and with the pain on Greg's face, I rearranged, rearranged my work hours so I could be home earlier. Greg's torture became my torture. Up close and personal, I witnessed the tyrannical tour, tyrannical toll gender dysphoria took on my husband. When the schedule allowed Gina's presence, I saw how peaceful and content my spouse was. When it was time for Gina to be shelved, I saw pure agony. Gina had to go back in the box so Greg could be Greg to the world. The pain in my spouse could not be contained. And night after night, I witnessed his meltdowns, crying, screaming, pounding fists on the floor, begging to have this misery removed from him. My spouse, Gina in brain, and Greg in body, was in an invisible and merciless prison, suffocating. I was powerless to help and we were alone. It wasn't just the nightly nightmares. The dissonance brought daytime distress too. I saw how hard it was for Greg to look in the closet, and see the, the right clothes on the right, the correct clothes, Gina's clothes, then begrudgingly select the guy pants and the guy shirt on the left. Each day, Greg put on his pastor persona and plugged away. He could be his usual self when he was teaching and preaching, making shut-in calls, attending congregational events. But I knew these moments were fleeting. I knew that the minute Greg walked through the parsonage door, that he would fall apart. Unable to abide the two existences that the mind-body mismatched forced upon him. I came to dread Sunday worship drawing to a close. I knew what was coming, and I knew it would be brutal. I came to dread leaving Greg alone when I went to work. I felt I knew Greg well enough. My head told me he was not one to harm himself that he would not be in the 41% who attempt suicide. But I also knew this. My spouse was in excruciating pain, and he was at the edge of the cliff. The nagging feeling in my heart silently begged, please stay in the 59. It became obvious to me, way sooner than Greg, that transitioning was the solution. 
the lesser of all evils remedy to lift him out of the earthly hell gender dysphoria had him in. This would mean transitioning socially. Greg living as Gina, presenting as a woman, wearing women's clothes, using a woman's name. It would mean transitioning medically, going on HRT, hormone replacement therapy, a testosterone blocker to suppress testosterone, and estradiol to raise Greg's estrogen to the level of a female. If it became necessary, perhaps even transitioning legally, changing name, driver's license, so that Gina could safely navigate in the world. If it became necessary, perhaps even transitioning surgically to alleviate the distress and anguish caused by the maleness of the body. Because I'm a person who makes lists, I made a pro-con list to Greg transitioning. On the pro side, number one, Greg has peace. Okay, on to the cons. <laughs> what happens to our marriage? How will this hurt the kids? What does this mean for our faith? Will we be disowned by family and friends? Will we be kicked out of the church? Where would we move that we would be safe? Would we be denied, denied jobs? Denied a place to live? Would we be able to make ends meet? What happens to our marriage? A little detour. Greg and I became acquainted in the summer of 2001. No, sorry, summer 2000. <laughs> He'd written an article in a Lutheran periodical, and I wrote him a letter so we could discuss a couple theological, theological points. After we'd hashed it out over a few exchanges, Greg invited me to subscribe to an email magazine he wrote, which I did, and that was the end of it. Fast forward to our next contact in summer 2001. Greg had written a piece for his e-zine explaining that he was going through a divorce. Not providing details other than the circumstances of the divorce allowed him to remain in the ministry and the kids were living with him, Greg laid out how difficult this event had been for him. But despite how depressed it had him, in true Greg ends on the gospel fashion, he would point to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, who never changes, never leaves us, who died for us, lives for us, who is our rock and fortress. My own marriage, which for a long time had been anything but a safe place for me, also ended in 2001. I sent an email to Greg commiserating with his brother in Christ. We began exchanging emails in July, slowly at first, then rapid fire by late August, when Greg admitted that if I lived in Port Hope, he would ask me out. And I responded, I felt the same way. Within days, we were head over heels. Greg asked if we could talk on the phone. I said, let's send each other pictures first, and we put photos in the mail. My impatient boy could not wait out the US Postal Service. He tracked down my parents' phone number, called, spoke to my mom, and she agreed to have me call him back. I dialed Greg's office, home office number. Darling, please stand up and indulge me as we recreate the first conversation we ever had. She's gonna call me back any minute now. It's late. Nobody else is gonna call my office phone. I'm not even gonna start with saying hello. But the thing is, Greg, are you really ready to do what you plan on doing? 
There's the phone. Julie? Yes. Do you have the rest of your life ahead of you? I do. Will you spend it with me? I will. <laughs> A marriage proposal <clears throat> uttered and accepted, sight on scene. I'd not viewed Greg's face, and he'd not seen mine. Yet our love transcended appearances. Through our words came the essence of the person, and our love was cultivated inside out. Back to 2013. I wanted these things for my spouse in this order. That he be alive, that he be sane, and that he be as healthy and happy as possible. And I wanted this for me, that I would be with Greg Eilers. I could not imagine life without my love, without the person with whom I fell in love inside out. Our marriage would be fine. It would be different. It would for sure be uncharted territory, but it would be intact and it would be fine. With that realization, the rest of those insurmountable concrete wall cons fell like a house of cards. They were still real practical concerns, but ones we would figure out together. Greg wasn't just reluctant to accept that transitioning was the answer. He fought it every step of the way. A vicious, a vicious cycle ensued from 2013 to 2017, beginning while we were still in Port Hope and continuing after Greg retired in June 2014 and we moved to Indianapolis. Greg goes on hormone replacement therapy Greg starts to feel peace. Greg is determined he won't transition and stops taking HRT. Greg crashes. Greg gives in, goes back on HRT. Repeat cycle over and over and over. The roller coaster never resting, the hurricane ever raging. Why was I certain that transitioning was the cure to Greg's torturous malady? I am a why person. If something is broken or doesn't work or is confusing, I am driven to analyze it, figure out the cause, and find a solution. This is how I approached Greg's gender dysphoria. If God created us male and female, why is it that most of us skate along just fine, never at odds with that, while others struggle. I got busy and dove into every article, resource, and book I could get my hands on, finding myself elbow deep in all things psychological, medical, theological, experiential. On my quest for why, I encountered a lot of what and when. Some of this, if you were here last night, and I believe most of you are, some of this may sound a bit repetitive of what Greg spoke of last night, but it's important. It's important that these things are understood. The list of conditions, diseases, and physical abnormalities that are congenital, that means present from birth, is lengthy, and many can be linked to a specific cause. An inborn condition might be inherited, AKA, genetic, are influenced by environmental factors, such as exposure in the womb to viruses, medications, or toxic chemicals. Birth defects range from being visibly discernible, Down syndrome, to internal, such as sickle cell disease. Some are detectable at birth, cleft lip. Others discovered later. 
Huntington's disease. The origin of some disorders is straightforward and widely accepted. A genetic test confirms cystic fibrosis. The Zika virus is known to cause microcephaly in children, infants born of infected mothers. For other conditions, especially those rooted in environmental factors, pinpointing a specific cause is less certain. That environmental influences can profoundly affect a fetus is irrefutable. Fetuses are immensely susceptible to pathogens in foreign substances, particularly during the first three months of pregnancy. Take thalidomide, a medication prescribed in the 1950s to alleviate morning sickness for pregnant women. When pregnant women taking the drug began giving birth to children with malformed limbs, a connection was made between the birth defect and the medication. Fetal alcohol syndrome, which results from alcohol exposure during pregnancy, also demonstrates how a substance affects a developing baby. Those with FAS can have malformed skeletons and brain and central nervous system problems. The link in these cases is obvious. Thalidomide interfered with the baby's development. Alcohol has adverse effects on babies while in the womb. There's no argument these conditions exist and no debate over the causes. Conditions with less clear-cut causes are subject to deliberation. Autism has not been attributed to a single cause. Research has suggested that a combination of genetics and environmental influences may increase one's risk, but a specific cause has not been identified. Most everyone recognizes, despite no smoking gun cause, that autism is a real condition and has a physiological effect on those who have it. Depression is equally elusive as to a cause. There are numerous factors that can contribute to the disease, which is complicated further by everyone's biology, genetics, and life experiences. Despite significant advances in neuroscience, much of the brain still remains a mystery. Most everyone recognizes, despite no smoking gun cause, that depression is a real condition and has a physiological effect on those who have it. One need not look far to see that maladies besiege mankind. As Christians, we know why maladies besiege mankind. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5.12. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, 5. You know to what these verses speak. Original sin. Because of the fall of Adam, the world is broken. Our bodies are broken. God made perfection, but man messed it up bringing forth the brokenness we humans navigate from the first day of our earthly existence. As evidenced by the plethora of congenital disorders, not even the child in the womb is spared. As I was learning about disorders of the human condition, whether present or birth or manifested later in life, I determined they fall into these categories. Those that have a pinpointed cause, versus those that do not. Cystic fibrosis, autism. Those that are easily seen by others versus those that are not. Cleft lip versus depression. Those that are easier for others to swallow versus those that make others uncomfortable. Often these are the reverse of seen versus unseen. Heart defects are not visible. Those are easier for others to swallow. 
Malformed limbs are visible and often make others uncomfortable. Continuing our lesson on fetal development. Sex is determined at conception according to the gene genes a person inherits from one's parents. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one pair of which is the sex chromosomes. Females typically have two X's, males typically an X and a Y. A child receiving two X's will be expected to develop female. A child receiving an X and a Y will be expected to develop male. Disorders of sex development, previously called intersex, describe conditions in which individuals are born with reproductive or sexual anatomies that don't fit neatly into male or female. In some cases, in some cases the condition is indicated at birth due to anatomy that is visibly atypical. For example, a male baby might have a very small penis, micropenis, or a female baby might have a very large clitoris. Other conditions might not be noticeable at birth, but become apparent at puberty or in adulthood. Disorders of sex development have either genetic or hormone disrupting causes. Here are, here are a few. Androgen and sensitivity syndrome. AIS falls on a scale, be complete, partial, mild, with a spectrum of effects. A genetic male with complete AIS is fully resistant to androgens, or masculinizing hormones. As a result, genitals do not form in the male pattern, and a person with AIS has an outward female appearance. Because a person with complete AIS has no uterus or cervix, the condition is often discovered when she does not begin to menstruate. Swire syndrome. Individuals with this condition have XY, male chromosomes, but are born without functional gonads. Those are the sex glands. And an, in, an individual with Swire syndrome appears outwardly female, has female genitalia, but no ovaries. Klinefelter syndrome. Most men have XY chromosomes, inheriting the X from their mother, the Y from their father. Individuals with Klinefelter syndrome are XXY, having an extra X chromosome. While most children with Klinefelter syndrome grow to live as men, some identify as women. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia. CAH affects people with XX chromosomes. A genetic abnormality causes the adrenal glands to make high levels of virilizing hormones, which has a masculinizing effect. All individuals, whether they possess XX, XY, or an atypical chromosomal combination, start their development in the same place. The gonads of a fetus are undifferentiated until around the six to seven week mark. At that point, a gene associated with the Y chromosome, SRY, begins to trigger the development of testes. At around nine weeks, the testes release the hormone testosterone, which bathes the fetus and is responsible for the masculinization of the brain and genitalia. In the absence of testosterone, as in the case of an XX fetus, female genitalia will develop. It is the disruption of this critical balance and timetable of hormones that many scientists believe can interfere with the gender formation of the brain. If, for example, a male fetus receives an inadequate supply of testosterone or is exposed to an excess amount of estrogen, the result is the brain fails to properly masculinize and instead is inclined toward a female identity. During my quest for knowledge, as I endeavored to unturn every stone and learn every detail, I came across diethylstrobrestrol, DES for short. 
DES was a synthetic estrogen prescribed from 1940 to 1971 to pregnant women who were prone to miscarriage, as it was thought it would help them carry their babies to term. When it was found, the drug caused a rare form of cervical cancer in the daughters of women who took it, DES was discontinued. Since then, numerous studies have linked an array of health problems in the children of DES mothers. Greg's mom, long deceased, could not answer the question whether she took DES. But I knew these things. First, Greg's mom had two miscarriages prior to being pregnant with Greg. And she was carrying Greg at the peak of the use of DES. Second, Greg's mom was under tremendous stress while pregnant with Greg. Her oldest son, Jimmy, was profoundly disabled due to doctors improperly medicating him as an infant and required constant care. Now, with Greg, child number four in utero, she and Greg's dad, struggling to care for a five-year-old Jimmy and two younger siblings, made the agonizing decision to place their precious Jimmy in state care. What does stress do? Stress causes the adrenal glands to release high levels of cortisol. What does high cortisol do? Amongst many other adverse effects, high cortisol disrupts progesterone and estrogen, hormones that must be in proper balance for the developing baby. Third, Greg had attributes that you would consider less masculine. No visible Adam's apple, much less body hair than your average male, and forgive me another stereotype, a much greater tendency to get emotional than your average male. Thanks, You're welcome. If a male fetus receives an inadequate supply of testosterone or is exposed to an excess amount of estrogen, the result is the brain fails to properly masculinize. When I came up for air from my research dive, I had clarity. It was highly plausible that my poor spouse, struggling his entire life with an unexplained internal sense of being female and presently battling to stay alive through the throes of gender dysphoria, had a female brain wired from birth. Because I took the time to think about something I'd never had to think about and previously never even considered was a thing, my female brain matches my female body, I began to comprehend how difficult this might be if it were not the case. How disconcerting it would be if I had this female brain, but a male body. It was one thing to witness Greg's pain, fierce and ferocious. But how does one truly grasp something so foreign? I thought, if only I could spend one day in Greg's brain to feel what it means to be transgender. It's probably for the best. I could not do that. I don't think I would survive one hour in the minefield of a mind-body mismatch. So what was to be done with a spouse of mine and his brain formed female in the hormonal environment of the womb? Oh, well, that's easy. I just go down to the computer store, get a shiny new central processing unit. Remember, that's the computer's brain, a solidly male one. I switch it out. If only. Brain transplant was off the table. And it appeared no one had figured out yet how to rewire the brain. What then was the viable option to relieve Greg's gender dysphoria? 
What would get us off this roller coaster of torment, out of this hurricane of despair? Surely not transitioning, which was fraught not only with a calm list full of disaster, but also Greg's relentless attempts at evasion. Surely, spiritual care was the answer. Spiritual care sought, exhaustively. Surely, prayer on top of prayer, top of prayer was the answer. If the Lord's ears could be worn out, we did it. Surely, talk therapy was the answer. We did that until the cows came home. Farm girl. None were successful, none were viable. All dangled a carrot of hope in front of us, but failed to be the balm. It was like a band aid for a severed limb. No dosage of spiritual care or psychological care was going to rewire the brain. We would have to adjust the external to match the internal. After Greg realized he needed to try transitioning, and we told the people in our lives it was happening, the internal strife he, and by extension me, suffered, was almost instantly matched by external tensions. None surprised us. We talked extensively about what the reaction would be and how family members and friends would handle the news. We had read enough and listened to enough experiences of other, other transgender persons that we knew we were in rough terrain. We were prepared. We were determined to be patient and to understand how difficult this would be for others. While people in situations are unique, there are common threads when a trans person reveals they have gender dysphoria or informs others they are transitioning. Some family and friends are supportive from the start. Perhaps they already have experience with a transgender person or perhaps they can wrap their heads around it. Some are opposed at first, but eventually begin to grasp what the transgender person is experiencing and come around to acceptance. Some, unable to abide the situation, sever ties permanently. For the closest family and friends, even the supportive ones, there is grief. How could there not be? This person's identity has been integral to yours. This person is your husband, your father, your brother, your son, your grandson, your best friend. This person is your wife, your mother, your sister, your daughter, your granddaughter, your best friend. Your loved one telling you that their internal sense does not, has not ever matched their internal sense. Sorry. Your loved one telling you your identity, their identity, does not match their internal sense. Makes you feel the foundation of your relationship was built on a lie. Your loved one telling you that they are now altering that identity feels like a loss. For too many trans folks, as soon as they open their mouths that they have gender dysphoria, this battle that is tearing them apart on the inside, their outside world crumbles. Too few around them take the time to listen. Too few take the time to learn. They are picked out of the house. They are disowned. They are ridiculed. They are fired from their job. They are kicked out of their church. Condemned. 
Rejection follows rejection follows rejection. They are accused of being selfish, easing their suffering at the expense of everyone else. They are accused of giving in to a sinful temptation because male and female, he created them. Slam the Bible shut, end of discussion. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51.5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5.12. And so death spread to all men. And so infirmities spread to all men. And so afflictions spread to all men. No one is immune. No part of our bodies is impervious. We are broken throughout our entire being down to the cellular level. Because of the fall, we have arthritis, asthma, autism. Because of the fall, we have heart disease, dementia, diabetes. Because of the fall, we have cystic fibrosis, cancer, multiple sclerosis. Because of the fall, we have sickle cell disease, spina bifida, Huntington's disease. Because of the fall, we have Swire syndrome, androgen insensitivity syndrome, and other disorders where chromosomes and anatomy do not align. Because of the fall, we are broken throughout our entire being. Yet, some insist that there is one aspect of human existence, gender, that was left untouched by the fall of Adam. Disorder corrupted God's perfect design, except somehow this one thing, the gender formation of the brain, remained unscathed. Thus, they trot out, male and female, God created them, and beat the transgender person over the head with it. Your gender dysphoria is a figment of your imagination. It is a mental illness. It is a moral failing. It is you giving into a movement. Your anguish is a choice. Hmm. A choice. Who chooses internal toyment? Who chooses a condition where discrimination, marginalization, and alienation are the standard result? Who chooses to be the object of scorn and ridicule? Who chooses a situation where you are disowned evicted, fired, even physically assaulted. Show of hands. Who here wants to sign up for that? Life has an abundance of challenges, but the majority are understood and accepted. Most everyone can commiserate with you most everyone can commiserate with you, excuse me. When you have a malady, they themselves know, or at least can fathom, depression, cancer, paralysis, blindness, deafness. People can imagine themselves in ordinary situations. They have a frame of reference. Gender issues, pretty much anything falling outside our binary norm, give people the willies, heebie-jeebies. 
The idea of transitioning sexes is so foreign that our instinct is to flee. If we cannot flee, we do our darndest to put it in a box. Put it in a box. Make it a simplistic issue. Transgender isn't real because male and female, he created them. Put it in a box. Shell out trite comparisons. Transgender isn't real because you can't make a Ford out of Chevy. Put it in a box. Deny the suffering, dignity, and life-saving treatment. Transgender isn't real because we can simply legislate it out of existence. Put it in a box. Transgender isn't real because it makes people uncomfortable. Transgender makes us uncomfortable. And a leper came to Jesus and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Matthew 8, verses 2 and 3. Praise God, Jesus didn't shy away from the discomfort of his broken creation and took that discomfort all the way to the cross. Praise God, Jesus had compassion on the suffering of his broken people, took that suffering all the way to the cross. Praise God that nothing, neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, no infirmities, no afflictions, no disorders, no maladies, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you. I wanted to address the con list. So Julie made the point there was one item on the pro list. And we made that pro and con list like three or four days after I told you if I don't transition, I might not survive. Julie is a doer. <laughs> Nothing sits around. She gets, gets into action. Uh, what was the first item on the con list? Our marriage. And that was the final one for her to answer for herself. But it didn't, I think it only took a week. And she knew that however our marriage looked, that we were going to survive because of the love and respect that we had for each other. And we just plain like being with each other. She cracks me up like crazy. I try to crack her up. <laughs> yeah. Next item. <laughs> um, how will this hurt the kids? How will this affect the kids? At any given time, all four of my kids just didn't know what to do with me. Two of them wrote me just horrible emails. And I decided, does anybody know the story of Jackie Robinson? The first uh, African American to play Major League Baseball in 1947. But before he was called up to the Major Leagues, the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Branch Rickey, said to Jackie Robinson, and Jackie Robinson also was a Christian, which I think helped. <laughs> I hope helped. Branch Rickey said, You're going to take it, man. People are going to call you every name in the book, and probably some that aren't in the book yet, and they're going to throw things at you, and you're not going to be able to stay in hotels with the white players, and you're going to have to eat in different restaurants, and on and on and on. And Branch Rickey said, you will never once be able to hand it back to anybody, or else you're going to lose the battle. And that was my attitude. So when my kids lashed out at me, I could only reply to them, 
I hear you. I love you. And when they couldn't have anything to do with me, I waited. And there was my attitude. My brothers had a hard time with their brother. Yeah, I wasn't really new. <laughs> and that's all I could do was to be patient with everybody. Next one. What does this mean for our faith? What does this mean for our faith? I told you last night, my faith just kept continually deepening. It was like the Holy Spirit took me by the scruff of the neck and just kept pushing me to Jesus, pushing me into the Bible. When I was in my uh, 20s, a woman in my church encouraged me to go to Bible class. And soon after I started going to Bible class, then I started reading the Bible in the morning. And that's been my practice now for 40 years. Uh, nowadays, I like to read the daily lectionary. So you read a Psalm, then an Old Testament reading that follows through. We just finished the book of Genesis and uh, something from an epistle, or New Testament, and you follow through and something from the gospel and you follow that gospel through. And Julie, well, Julie went through a crisis of faith when she was a teenager, but that's her story. But she came back when she was in her 20s so that by the time we met, she was again solidly Lutheran. And she, we just never wavered in our trust. The Lord is the same yesterday and forever. What stuff changes with us, but he's the rock on which we can stand. And the Holy Spirit just kept setting us upon the rock. Next one. Will we be disowned by family or friends? Will we be disowned by family and friends? Everybody disowned us except Reverend Mark Buto. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there were a number of Missouri Synod pastors who reached out to me, who were understanding, who listened to me, but they virtually all did it quietly because in the Missouri Synod, you gotta be very careful to make it look like you're pro-transgender. Um, next one. Kicked out of our church. Kicked out of our church. We moved to Indianapolis when we retired in 2014 and um, well, I was going to remain male, so we visited Missouri Synod churches, and we thought we found a church home. But then I thought I was going to have to try transitioning, and we invited the pastor over for supper and told him. And we loved the guy. Excellent preacher. Very similar to you last night, Pastor. Don't get a big head. Um, your, your folks love your preaching, by the way. They don't like anything else about you, but they love it. <laughs> because there you're contained in... Um, that poor pastor, when I told him, he was just, he didn't know what to do. He just didn't know what to do. So we had to go find someplace else. We ended up in an ELCA church for two short stints. We tried going into Missouri Synod Church and joined the church when I was Gina. And when that hit the winds, I think I'm going to talk about this fast this afternoon, so I'm not going to. But after I resumed living as a male, then about a year later in 2020, we returned to the Missouri Synod. So we've been back in the Missouri Synod for four years. Next. Where would we move that we'd be safe? Where would we move that we'd be safe? We thought about different, we thought of like Portland, Oregon, because Portland, Oregon is really liberal. We wound up in Indianapolis because our daughter lived in Indy. We have a daughter in Georgia, at that time one in West Virginia, although he's in Indy now, and one in my hometown in Michigan. So we settled on Indy partly because it was centrally located, and we thought it was big enough that if I transitioned, we would be safe, and that Julie would be able to find a job. Um, the interesting thing we did know about Indianapolis at the time, for how conservative Indiana is, Indianapolis is, is more metropolitan. Cities tend to be that way. Uh, everywhere you went in, um, in Indiana, it was all Trump signs, but in Indianapolis, it was all Biden signs. That just tells the whole story right there. Next. No. Would we be denied jobs? Would we be denied, denied jobs? Well, I didn't try to get a job. I thought I was going to, though. In 2018, after I'd finished my transition, I thought I was going to go out into the world and try to get a job as Gina. 
Um, and that's the reason I resumed living as a guy, so I wouldn't have to get a job. <laughs> my superior humor was not affected by my gender dysphoria. <laughs> Julie found a job, her tax experience helped her to find a job, and she took over being the breadwinner. I now draw Social Security, so I feel good, along with my tiny uh, Missouri Senate pension. I now feel better that I'm contributing. Oh, and I make about $10 a month in royalties from my books. <laughs> Next. Denied a place to live. Denied a place to live. Thankfully, we, we wound up with a gay realtor, so <laughs> that helps, and we, uh, and then, when I transitioned in our brand new neighborhood, uh, the folks were wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Anything else on the list? Uh, would we be able to make ends meet? Kind of already covered Would we be that. able to make ends meet? And praise the Lord, we did. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, what happens to our marriage? Oh, and, oh, I think we addressed that one. As I said last night, every couple should talk as much as we did. Uh, when I counseled people getting married, one of the sessions was completely on communication. Because if you can communicate respectfully and listen to each other, man, you can just conquer anything. But if you can't communicate, you are S-C-R-E-W-E-D. <laughs> You're not going to make it. I imagine we are up against 10 o'clock. Pastor, uh, if you must. Thank you very much, Julie. That was fantastic. And uh, Greg's right. You are the smartest person you know. <laughs> it occurs to me, and I kind of had a pastoral thought as I'm listening. Um, very easy, especially, especially as Lutherans, to want to respond to what we perceive as sin with the right words, of, like to be faithful in doctrine. So, so if someone comes and says, well, I'm transgender, or, you know, dealing with this, you say, but... God says in his word, made them male and female. That's it. I've been faithful because I, I, I kept faithful to God's word. And that says a lot more about how we are responding, doesn't it, than it does about the person that they're struggling with. And I think it's something to be conscious of um, because when Christ tells us to love others, he doesn't mean by sort of CYA. You know what that means, cover your butt. Um, he tells us to love others. Um, so we got a little 